All right, so Bullfinch's Mythology, Chapter 39. I have long since associated the number 39 with Lucifer um, because, the, you know, if it's not, it doesn't seem proper or appropriate to compare our real life to a video game. But if level 39 is what Lucifer attained and angels are levels 30 and above, gods are level 40 and above, and, you know, um... No, I wouldn't even say that. I would say Nehalom, you know, this kind of hybrid, stronger than the originals. Angel and Demon, hybrid theory, Linkin Park, is level 30s and above. And 20s and above is you have one, but not the other. You have your angel, but you don't have your de devil or demon. And level 10 and above is you don't have both you don't have angel you don't have demon you're level 10 and above a man or a woman you're a human so humans are levels 10 and above and below 10 is the animal kingdom all the way to fucking level zero is sort of like a caterpillar being tortured alive by itch Dumon wasps in stephen j gold's non-moral nature so, level chapter 39, Lucifer, kind of combined with this Thor's visit to Jotunheim. I think that's how you pronounce it. Thor's visit to Jotunheim, the giant's country. One day, the god Thor, with his servant, Thialfi, and accompanied by Loki, set out on a journey to the giant's country. Thialfi was, of all men, the swiftest of foot. He bore Thor's wallet containing their provisions. When night came on, they found themselves in an immense forest and searched on all sides for a place where they might pass the night. And at last came to a very large hall with an entrance that took the whole breadth of one end of the building. Here they lay down to sleep. But towards midnight were alarmed by an earthquake, which shook the whole edifice. Thor, rising up, called on his companions to seek with him a place of safety. On the right, they found an adjoining chamber, into which the others entered. But Thor remained at the doorway with his mallet in his hand, prepared to defend himself. Whatever might happen, a terrible groaning was heard during the night, and at dawn of day, Thor went out and found lying near him a huge giant who slept and snored in the way that had alarmed them so. It is said that for once Thor was afraid to use his mallet, and as the giant soon waked up, Thor contented himself with simply asking his name. My name is Skrymir, said the giant, but I need not ask thy name, for I know that thou art the god Thor. But what has become of my glove? Thor then perceived that what they had taken overnight for a hall was the giant's glove, and the chamber where his two companions had sought refuge was the thumb. Skrymir then proposed that they should travel in company, and Thor consenting, they sat down to eat their breakfast, and when they had done, Skrymir packed all the provisions into one wallet, threw it over his shoulder, and strode on before them taking such tremendous strides that they were hard put to it to keep up with him. So they traveled the whole day, and at dusk, Skrymir chose a place for them to pass the night in under a large oak tree. Skrymir then told them he would lie down to sleep. But take ye the wallet, he added, and prepare your supper. Skrymir 
soon fell asleep and began to snore strongly. But when Thor tried to open the wallet, he found the giant had tied it up so tight he could not untie a single knot. At last, Thor became wroth and grasping his mallet with both hands, he struck a furious blow on the giant's head. Skrymir, awakening, merely asked whether a leaf had not fallen on his head and whether they, they had supped and were ready to go to sleep. Thor answered that they were just going to sleep, and so saying, went and laid himself down under another tree. But sleep came not that night to Thor. And when Skrymir snored again, so loud that the forest re-echoed with the noise, he arose, and grasping his mallet, launched it with such force at the giant's skull that it made a deep dint in it. Skrymir, awakening, cried out, What's the matter? Are there any birds perched on this tree? I felt some moss from the branches fall on my head. How fares it with thee, Thor? But Thor went away hastily, saying that he had just then awoke, and that as it was only midnight, there was still time for sleep. He, however, resolved that if he had an opportunity of striking a third blow, it should settle all matters between them. A little before daybreak, he perceived that Skrymir was again fast asleep. And again, grasping his mallet, he dashed it with such violence that it forced its way into the giant's skull up to the handle. But Skrymir sat up and stroking his cheek said, an acorn fell on my head. What? Art thou awake, Thor? Methinks it time for us to get up and dress ourselves. But you have not now a long way before you to the city called Utgard. I have heard you whispering to one another there that I am not a man of such... I am not a man of small dimensions. But if you come to Utgard, you will see there are many men much taller than I. Wherefore, I advise you, when you come there, not to make too much of yourselves. For the followers of Utgard, Loki, will not brook the boasting of such little fellows as you are. You must take the road that leads eastward. Mine lies northward, so we must part here. Hereupon he threw his wallet over his shoulders and turned away from them into the forest. And Thor had no wish to stop him or to ask for any more of his company. Thor and his companions proceeded on their way and towards noon descried a city standing in the middle. Of a plain. It was so lofty that they were obliged to bend their necks quite back on their shoulders in order to see to the top of it. On arriving, they entered the city. And seeing a large palace before them with the door wide open, they went in and found a number of men of prodigious stature sitting on benches in the hall, going further Further, they came up before their, before the king, Utgard Loki, whom they saluted with great respect. The king, regarding them with a scornful smile, said, If I do not mistake me, that stripling yonder must be the god Thor. Then, addressing himself to Thor, he said, Perhaps thou mightst be more than thou appearest to me. What are the feats that thou and thy fellows deem yourself skilled in? For none, for no one is permitted to remain here who does not, in some feat or other, excel all other men. The feat that I know, said Loki, is to eat quicker than anyone else, and in this I am ready to give a proof against anyone here who may choose to compete with me. 
That will indeed be a feat, said Utgard Loki. If thou performest what thou promisest, and it shall be tried forthwith. He then ordered one of his men, who was sitting at the farther end of the bench, and whose name was Logi, to come forward and try his skill with Loki. A trough filled with meat having been set on the hall floor, Loki placed himself at one end and Logi at the other, and each of them began to eat as fast as he could, until they met in the middle of the trough. But it was found that Loki had only eaten the flesh, while his adversary had devoured both flesh and bone and the trough to boot. All the company therefore adjudged that Loki was vanquished. Utgard Loki then asked what feat the young man who accompanied Thor could perform. The Alfi answered that he would run a race with anyone who might be matched against him. The king observed that skill in running was something to boast of. But if the youth would win the match, he must display great agility. He then arose and went with all who were present to a plain where there was good ground for running on and calling a young man named Hugi, bade him run a match with Thialfi. In the first course, Hugi so much outstripped his competitor that he turned back and met him not far from the starting place. Then they ran a second and a third time, but Thialfi met with no better success. Utgar Loki then asked Thor in what feats he would choose to give proofs of that prowess for which he was so famous. Thor answered that he would try a drinking match with anyone. Utgard Loki bade his cupbearer bring the large horn which his followers were obliged to empty when they had trespassed in any way against the law of the feast. The cupbearer, having presented it to Thor, Utgard Loki said, Whoever is a good drinker will empty that horn at a single drought. Though most men make two of it, but the most puny drinker can do it in three. Thor looked at the horn, which seemed of no extraordinary size, though somewhat long. However, as he was very thirsty, he set it to his lips and, without drawing breath, pulled as long and as deeply as he could, that he might not be obliged to make a second drought of it. But when he set the horn down and looked in, he could scarcely perceive that the liquor was diminished. After taking breath, Thor went to it again with all his might. But when he took the horn from his mouth, it seemed to him that he had drunk rather less than before. Although the horn could now be carried without spilling. How now, Thor, said Utgard Loki. Thou must not spare thyself, if thou meanest to drain the horn at the sing at the third drought, thou must pull deeply, and I must needs say that thou wilt not be called so mighty a man here as thou art at home, if thou showest no greater prowess in other feats than me methinks will be shown in this. Thor, full of wrath, again set the horn to his lips and did his best to empty it, but on looking in, found the liquor was only a little lower, so he resolved to make no further attempt, but gave back the horn to the cupbearer. I now see plainly, said Utgard Loki, that thou art not quite so stout as we thought thee, but thou but wilt thou try any other feat? No, methinks thou art not likely to bear any prize away with thee hence. What new trial hast thou to propel? said Thor. We have a very trifling game here, answered Utgard Loki, in which we exercise none but children. It consists in merely lifting my cat from the ground. Nor should I have dared to mention such a feat to the great Thor if I had not already observed that thou art by no means what we took thee for. 
As he finished speaking, a large gray cat sprang on the hall floor. Thor put his hand under the cat's belly and did his utmost to raise him from the floor. But the cat, bending his back, had, notwithstanding all Thor's efforts, only one of his feet lifted up, seeing which Thor made no further attempt. This trial has turned out, said Utgar Loki, just as I imagined it would. The cat is large, but Thor is little in comparison to other men. Little as you call me, answered Thor, let me see who among you will come hither now I am in wrath and wrestle with me. <laughs> I see no one here, said Akar Loki, looking at the men sitting on the benches. Who would not think it beneath him to wrestle with thee? Let somebody, however, call hither that old crone, my nurse Ellie, and let Thor wrestle with her if he will. She has thrown to the ground many a man not less strong than this Thor is. A toothless old woman then entered the hall and was told by Utgard Loki to take hold of Thor. The tale is shortly told. The more Thor tightened his hold on the crone, the firmer she stood. At length, after a very violent struggle, Thor began to lose his footing and was finally brought down upon one knee. Atkar Loki then told them to desist, adding that Thor had now no occasion to ask anyone else in the hall to wrestle with him, and it was also letting getting late. So he showed Thor and his companions to their seats, and they passed the night there in good cheer. The next morning, at break of day, Thor and his companions dressed themselves and prepared for their departure. Utgard Loki ordered a table to be set for them, on which there was no lack of victuals or drink. After the repast, Utgard Loki led them to the gate of the city and on parting asked Thor how he thought his journey had turned out and whether he had met with any men stronger than himself. Thor told him that he could not deny but that he had brought great shame on himself. And what grieves me most, he added, is that ye will call me a person of little worth. Nay, said Utgard Loki, it behooves me to tell thee the truth. Now thou art out of the city, which so long as I live and have my way, thou shalt never enter again. And by my troth, had I known beforehand that thou had so much strength in thee, and wouldst have brought me so near to a great mishap. I would not have suffered thee to enter this time. Know then that I have all along deceived thee by my illusions. First in the forest where I tied up the wallet with iron wire so that thou couldst not untie it. After this thou gavest me three blows with thy mallet. The first though the least would have ended my days had it fallen on me, but I slipped aside and thy blows fell on the mountain, where thou wilt find three glens, one of them remarkably deep. These are the dints made by thy mallet. I have made use of similar illusions in the contests you have had with my followers. In the first Loki, like hunger itself, devoured all that was set before him, but Logi was in reality nothing else than fire, and therefore consumed not only the meat, but the trough which held it. Hugi, with whom Thialfi contended in running, was thought, and it was impossible for Thialfi to keep pace with that. When thou in thy turn didst attempt to empty the horn, Thou didst perform by my troth a deed so marvelous that had I not seen it myself, I should never have believed it. For one end of that horn reached the sea, which thou wast not aware of, but when thou comest to the shore, thou wilt perceive how much the sea had sunk by thy droughts. 
Thou didst perform a feat no less wonderful by lifting up the cat. And to tell thee the truth, when we saw that one of his paws was off the floor, we were all of us terror-stricken. For what thou tookest for a cat was in reality the Midgard serpent that encompasseth the earth. And he was so stretched by thee that he was barely long enough to enclose it between his head and tail. Thy wrestling with Ellie was also a most astonishing feat, for there was never yet a man, nor ever will be, whom old age, for such in fact was Ellie, will not sooner or later lay low. But now, as we are going to part, let me tell thee that it will be better for both of us if thou never come near me again. For thou for shalt thou do so, I shall again defend myself by other illusions, so that thou wilt only lose thy labor and get no fame from the contest with me. On hearing these words, Thor in a rage laid hold of his mallet and would have launched it at him, but Utgard Loki had disappeared. And when Thor would have returned to the city to destroy it, he found nothing around him but a verdant plain.